Okay, everybody, um, if I could ask those of you who are staying for the Approaches to Teaching CS session to please take your seats. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, one quick um, uh, reminder tonight, there is a dinner that starts at 8 um, featuring 2-Bit Circus. And um, the first video that we saw featuring Nolan Bushnell and his family is actually related to 2-Bit Circus. So um, <laughs> one of his sons, Brent Bushnell, is a creator of 2-Bit Circus. Um, he was the one wearing the Lego bow tie. And and uh, they're providing the entertainment for the evening. And it's actually, um, what they do is large scale um, games, um, carnival games um, with a 21st century spin. So it's a way to engage um, not just students, but adults in um, STEM and engineering and arts and design. So it should be really fun. So you all should come out at eight, eight o'clock tonight. Um, and so without further ado, I wanted to introduce um, our panelists um, uh, for today, for the CS, um, uh, for just a teaching CS panel. Um, moderating for us today is Dave Wolber, who's at the University of San Francisco. And um, Dave runs USF's Democratized Computing Lab, which focuses on emp empowering artists, designers, um, uh, kids, women, men, and, and everyone really, it sounds like. Um, to add coding to their creative arsenals. We also have um, Dan Garcia. Dan is at UC Berkeley, and he's a teaching professor in the EECS department there. Um, he serves on the ACM Education Board, uh, the APCS Principals Development Committee, and was chosen as an ACM Distinguished Educator in 2012. Welcome, Dan. Um, we also have Ila Norbach. Did I get that right? Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, as professor of robotics, Ila has been exploring human robotic uh, human-robot interaction with the aim of creating rich, effective, and satisfying interactions between humans and robots. And um, we have, we we also have with us today, um, I'm very happy to announce Cynthia Solomon, who is a researcher and computing pioneer. And um, uh, Cynthia, along with Seymour Papert and uh, Wally Fritzig, created the first programming language for children, so many of you know Logo. Um, and Cynthia has a long relationship with MIT, uh, Media Lab, and One Laptop Per Child uh, Foundation, in addition to teaching, consulting, and scholarship. So um, go for it, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, um, happy to be here. Uh, in about 2009, I got invited over to Google um, by Hal Abelson, who's also a Logo person. And, and he was doing a two-year sabbatical from MIT. And he said, and there was a workshop, and he, there was these things called smartphones that I'd never heard of, I don't think at the time. Uh, he said, look, we've got this new visual language. It's not named yet, but it's gonna be this really cool thing. And you can kind of try it out this weekend. And I tried it out, it didn't work. It was, it was, yeah, <laughs> but, but Hal said, you know, trust me, it's, it's gonna work. And, and, and so I started teaching that in that next semester and all, it was just very engaging, very motivating for students. Um, and at the time, we taught like one section of CS at my school, USF, one beginning section, right? And that course got things going. And of course, there's been a few other things that have got CS educa education going, including everybody in this room. And now USF, like a lot of schools, I think we teach eight sections a year, a semester, beginning sections at a very small school. So my point partially is the hordes are coming. We've got a bunch of people coming to the park to play. Uh, and it's this huge responsibility, right? How do we engage them? How do we keep them? And how do we actually you know, build the future by teaching these kids um, computer science? Um, so anyway, my first question for this illustrious group is, uh, what do you do in your schools? What innovative teaching practices are you using to, to have success? Um, so at uh, UC Berkeley, we, we were invited to Jan's conference in Chicago in 2008 when the idea, the seminal idea of CS principles you know, came about. And I, the, mo I, I, the date was uh, October 26th, because it's the, my wife's birthday. So we came back, apologized for missing her birthday, came back to Berkeley and I saw the writing on the wall and I said, we see CS principles in the horizon, we need to be, to create our own version of that. So we, we kept the great parts of the course that we had, had before, that was a functional idea, very much it was like 
a watered down sick pee. It was actually Hal Abelson and uh, Jerry Sussman's sick pee course. We loved it taught really powerful ideas to non-majors, functional programming, recursion, things that you say you can't teach. We, we taught those, but we liked that. But we also saw the writing on the wall that blocks-based programming was amazing. Some of the work that came out of MIT and Scratch, we loved that. So we merged that to a new course called The Beauty and Joy of Computing. Uh, we founded that in 2009. Uh, we since got some funding from NSF to build out our PD for that. We've been doing that for the last six years, thanks to Infosys. We are now bringing that even to more, more teachers. We had almost 100 teachers funded last year. 200 teachers are coming to Berkeley, to San Francisco State, to have a huge BJC Palooza with that. So we've had tremendous success in bringing this course to high schools and, and to students all across the country. Another hat I wear is the CS Principals Development Committee. So I'm delighted to see 53,000 students taking this, the AP CS Principals course. So it, it's a lot of folks put together. You know, my team is a team of 15 people, the language SNAP that came out of scratch. So a lot of people putting together to push the CS for all effort, but it's really exciting to be here. And it, thank you for emphasis for hosting this crossroads the last couple of years. It's really allowed a lot of great conversations to happen and the ball to continue to push forward. What we're doing that I think is a bit unusual and uh, it's definitely prepare for a left turn here. Um, we're taking computer science and trying not to teach it in a silo. And so what you'll see if you look at the way Carnegie Mellon and the Create Lab in particular have been thinking about computer science is we don't teach it in a computer science course. So at the K through 12 level, we entangle it with robotics and then we put it in poetry class. So you read a poem and then you build a robot and then you program that robot using an iconic programming language. The reason we do that is because the talents of all the diverse students in the classroom show. You see the ones who care about expression, the ones who care about rhetoric, the ones who love poetry actually falling in love with programming because now they can express themselves vis-a-vis -vis the poetry. So we're constantly in this world of transdisciplinary education. We're now doing this at the undergraduate level. This is brand new, but we created uh, through the Humanities College at Carnegie Mellon a series of grand challenge courses for freshmen coming into Carnegie Mellon. The problem we're facing is we have a ton of CS students coming in. However, they're not getting ethics training. And so they're not thinking clearly or cleverly about what role computer science needs to play in shaping the future in an equitable way. How will we make society better through computer science? It's not something we hit head on. So what we decided is let's do it the very first semester that freshmen come to Carnegie Mellon. So that they start with a very broad transdisciplinary view. We have a series of courses we're just introducing now one uh, taught by humanities and computer science, uh, Tom Cortina in computer science, is called the history of computer science. And it's really a very careful historical introduction to computer science. Another one taught by humanities and by me is called AI and humanity. It's about the dystopian social possibilities in how AI can change society and how we have to think about that and gird ourselves for that as we think about designing computational systems in the future. And then we have one on gender and we have one on race. So gender, race, humanity in terms of inequity, and dystopia and history. And in every one of these cases, I think fundamentally what we're doing is taking computer science out of the computer science classroom and mixing together humanities students and computer science students from day one at Carnegie Mellon. Um. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what was just talked about is what Seymour Packard and I were doing in 1968-69, and then we didn't have a turtle then, but in 1970 and 71, we taught fifth graders, and by then we had floor turtles and display turtles. And what we did was very much what you guys have just been describing. And there, that was beauty and joy. I'm told not to use that expression. I don't know why, but... Not by me. Uh, it wasn't by me. <laughs> uh, but what I'm doing today is being very skeptical of what's happening in elementary school and uh, kind of afraid. Computer science uh, in the way of an AP course is not what's needed in elementary school. What's needed is the kind of things you're talking about, that you're doing in college, but that's the kind of thing. What excited many of us, like me and probably the rest of the panel, was the creativity, the uh, uh, freedom to explore, and the feedback that um, debugging was a central activity and was a um, 
a very worthwhile activity. And I don't think that following a curriculum um, is going to necessarily achieve that. I mean, uh, Seymour Packard always uh, fought against curricula, and I can see why, because I see what's happening now as the computer science folks are moving in to pre-college pre education. For me, it's quite scary. Thank you, yeah, uh, so I, I, I tend to separate people, and this is a mass generalization, but between um, puzzle doers and people that want to solve more real world problems or build things and create things. And I think in CS we've often been really good training puzzle doers to learn how to code, but maybe not as good teaching this other group of people that they want to use this tool to solve some, some problem. Um, so this kind of gets right to the diversity and equity issues, and I'm hoping this group, if you can spe specifically, what, what are some things you do to engage that other group? And also, how do you retain them? How do you keep them in, in CS? Um, well, the, uh, the diversity, the diversity comes, if you, if you create an exciting place, Word will get around and more students who are diverse will, will try to find you. So we, you know, we started, I think the first year we had maybe 30, 35% women, and it's about to non-majors. That, that was about the same when we'd had the class before that was all just programming in the text-based language and scheme. Um, and as we continue to, to bring a lot of energy and bring a lot of enthusiasm, at the end of the, at the, end of the year we ask the students to draw a piece of art that represents their, their and we you know, give them extra credit for kind of doing the effort, but they draw piece, pictures and they draw, they write poems about what the course meant to them. And I have students at the end pull on my shirt and say, Dan, I gotta tell you how much this has changed my life. I'm now changing majors. This course has made a difference. We now have 60% of our students are women. You know, we've shattered the record at Berkeley for diversity in terms of, of the gender equity issue. So we're even thinking about male outreach because we're not big enough guys. No, I'm just kidding. But the, we, we're, I think part of what makes it work is the creativity, which is exactly what you mentioned. The creativity is what lets them, so, you know, we, I, I'm almost, uh, there's, a, there's a movement called the Nifty Movement where you try to collect the best assignments, and that's the assignment you give to everybody. And I, I tell the, the Nick, Carlotta's a good friend of mine, I say, Nick, I, I'm an anti-Nifty person. What do you mean? Anti I said, because I believe the most en engaged person is a person who's writing their own program. Not writing your program, I don't care how nifty it is, writing their own program. And part of what we in the CS Principles family believe is so effective is the idea that you have this create task and you create anything you want. It's not, and people, we had a higher ed meeting and they said, make a list, make a list because the students can't choose, the students tell me they can't choose. And we kept saying, no, no list. It's whatever the student wants to do, let them, force them to have that hard discussion to find out what they want to do and build it. And then you see at the end, I built this, this is my idea. No one told me, it was, and you see such joy in the demos and the presentation. So I think really it's about the creativity is the anchor, it's the first big idea and it's the first idea for a good reason. So I think part of what the success we've seen and other folks in the CS principles that I see in the room have seen is that idea that you are creating what you care about. The Explore task is about you research some innovation you care about, not what they told you was interesting, or from a list, oh, self-driving cars, 3D printing. No, whatever you care about, that's what you do. So it's all about the local, the local, the, what, what the student really desires at the end of the day. When I think about this issue of the consequentiality of computer science, puzzles versus real world problems. What keeps me up at night is the idea that computer science has grown up. It has power. The tools that we give our children have more power than they used to have. And day by day, our students can create, they can invent with computer science something that has actual social ramifications. And the very fact that they can do that, the fact that they can question somebody else's privacy, that they can affect people in, in major ways means that we have a responsibility for them to actually do problem finding, to come up with their own problems to solve and solve them. So we have a way of thinking about that. We call it fluency. <coughs> and an attitude we have is we want the student to become fluent with technology, not literate, but fluent. By fluent, I mean that they can hijack technology and use it for explicit social good. So how do we do that? We can't do it with puzzles. I actually have a serious aversion to puzzles for that reason. We have to do real world problems, but we don't want to give them the real world problems either. So what we do is we think of this in three stages. One, inquiry. Teach the students to conduct their own set of inquiry. 
And big data makes that easy. There's so much data out there that we can make available to the students that they can ask questions that are difficult and avail themselves of information to try and understand what that status is. For instance, we take census information from the United States Census Bureau. We make all of it available to our students. So they can take, for instance, racial, gender gaps, pay gaps, and even police uh, uh, arrest rates. And they can actually visualize all of this on a moving map so that they can do inquiry. They can understand what is the inequities in society that exist today. Then we go to narrative. This is where the computer programming comes in. Have the students learn to use their programming skills to create a narrative that makes sense of the data they're seeing, to tell a story that they care about. And then the last thing that's often missing in education is advocacy. So now put the students on a stage. Put them in front of the city council. Put them in front of the police department so that they can tell their story using the computer science artifacts that they have created. So you're learning as a student to forge your own sense of personal identity through creating a sense of inquiry, through creating <coughs> a storytelling that's rhetorically compelling through narrative, and that's where you're doing computer science. But then you go one step further than that, and you make sure that they have the chance to be privileged in society, to have a voice that's boosted, and to have people actually listen to what they have to say. Many, many examples of that that I can tell, but fundamentally it means changing the power hegemonic structure of society so that students are no longer at the bottom of a hegemony of power, but rather on top. Somebody who deserves to be listened to, and somebody that uses computer science to create a boosted voice that we all need to listen to. Um, uh, this is, again, reminiscent of what we did with children in Logo in 1968-69. Children were writing poetry in Logo, and they were designing um, projects that they wanted. It was a very hard thing for them to be in charge. And we did more so when we had turtles where you had graphics. Um, the kids were telling a story all the time. And uh, they did sort of games. The important thing also was to apply it to um, we were involved with circus arts because circus arts is, some circus arts are very procedural. And, and there was a bit of recursion. And these were the things that we uh, emphasized with the children. Debugging was the primary thing. So I, I for example, taught kids to walk on stilts, to juggle, and that's full of. Um, bugs that you could relate to yourself. And it, that was the personal, but making, making computing personal, um, expressive and personal was very important. Today, I look at um, things like Scratch, which was designed to let it, it children make stories. And um, I, I uh, like Snap because I could start doing turtle geometry again. With Scratch, it's very hard to do turtle geometry because of the way uh, the sprites are facing. And, uh, and I did find a bug in Snap, I have to tell you all, and it's being fixed, and it has to do, I can tell that if I found this bug, nobody is doing turtle geometry in Snap or they would have found the bug. So I would like to start getting them to do turtle geometry. It's beautiful, and uh, SNAP has a directional sprite, so it makes it easy. And when I, uh, lots of activity is with big data. Um, SNAP, Scratch, and a very interesting Wolfram language is um, entering. I think that's where their future is, with the Wolfram language myself. Because um, you ought to look at it. It's very powerful, and um, it, it's uh, being used um, by Wolfram. <laughs> anyway, um, what we did and what is being done, and you can tell from the is continuing to look at devices that can be computer controlled. That you can 
relate to. Um, there were several projects that Papert was involved in in, in uh, countries like Thailand, where people came up with incredible devices to hack their environment using logo. At that time, logo was there wasn't a scratch to use or a snap. And um, so I think he continues to look for things that can help communities. And children want to be part of that. Let me just add really quick. In terms of connective community, I think one of the things that I've seen a lot of teachers do very effectively to teach global impact, but they do what we do and we suggest in RPD and what other folks have been doing is to bring up a, an item in the computing in the news every day. So the teacher does, reads the New York Times before class and then says, look, here's how computing is affecting all of us. Here's ransomware, here's this, here's, here's some great new innovations that are coming out of it. And what ends up, the teachers end up saying what works really well for them is the teacher kind of models it for the first month of the, of the year. And then the teacher asks the students to go out and find something. So the students are going out and reading the paper and they're pulling back and summarizing a piece that's m meaningful to them. Maybe they don't care about the cybersecurity stuff, but oh, Pokemon Go is this new thing. And so they'll talk about how it's in the news for different reasons. And oh, somebody walked off the edge of a you know, railroad platform because they were playing it. Oh, look at the dangers and what are the issues? You know, people are walking more. All those interesting ideas, but this, it's all student driven. It's about that student agency. And I think bringing computing in the news and the global impact as the big idea is a really powerful, one of the wonderful things about CS principles. So it's, it's connected, you mentioned connected with community, it's connected with the larger worldwide connection with computing. Thank you, thank you. So I think we're time for QA, you said? Yeah, that's okay. perfect. Yep. And just a reminder to hold the uh, microphone up to you so the video can capture you. And if you could introduce yourself before you ask your question. Yeah, hi, I'm Josh Paley. I teach uh, computer science at Gunn High School in Palo Alto. Um, and Dan, I love you. Um, speaking of student agency, though, um, this is just a question. It, it seems to me that the community piece that all of you have alluded to in one form or another is one of the things that makes Scratch so wonderful. I'm begging you, get it there for a snap. Begging. Here, I'm on my knees. See this? I'm, 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 viol I'm violating the camera rule. I'm on my knees. Give it to us. <laughs> Takes a lot of work, Josh. We have a beta version ready to go. We have a beta version ready to go. We just need to get some more kinks worked out. You, you've got a beta version? Yeah, Bernard's built a beta version. We're, we're ready to go. Feed me. <laughs> the, scratch, the Scratch folks have a lot of volunteers um, that are process, process the projects before they get uh, displayed. My favorite story is of when Scratch was first around I was teaching seventh graders and they had computers at home and uh, they were telling me that their project got rejected. I said, what well, was it? Show it to me. Well, it was a donkey humping an elephant. <laughs> uh, by, by the way, uh, App Inventor now has a community gallery. Just to let you know. Um, this seems like, a, I mean, to those who are not involved in this, it may seem like a, you know, it may, shouldn't be that big a thing, but for a kid to routinely, without thinking about it, share their work with the world and their friends and so on, it's not a small thing, it's an enormous thing. And so, I mean, like the getting on my knees thing, I'm actually, I mean, it may look funny, but I'm serious. Like, it's a big, big deal, and I know you know it, I just wanted to whine a lot. Hi, I'm Trish Williams, and I'm a member of the California State Board of Education. Uh, this is uh, just a slight shift from the topic, but I consider it on topic. Uh, I know that I think the two of you, uh, Carnegie Mellon and UC Berkeley, have uh, Google Awards to look at ways to expand uh, student access to your con uh, computer science programs. Is that correct? I'm looking at... Carnegie Mellon, I, I know UC Berkeley. Carnegie does. Mellon does, I'm not involved in the project, okay. but I know them. So, so you, may, you may not consider this on topic, but I'm, I am concerned, especially with CSP becoming so popular, with more states uh, adopting some form of computer science standards, which sends a signal that it's important and helps line up other state policy work. Some of the universities changing where they, uh, where they count computer science in their 
uh, yeah, in their admissions criteria to give it more weight. All of those factors are going to converge over the next five years to uh, even further escalate than is currently true. Student demand, either for computer science majors or for taking intro courses or making them into minors. And I'm very concerned that all those things converging, there's going to be no room at the end when this more diverse student body comes up and wants to, wants to join the, the fun and the, and the play. So if, if you will accept that as a question in terms of if you have been doing things uh, at your school to try to increase your capacity to accept more students, uh, admit them in, and graduate them in computer science, I would appreciate hearing about that. Well, let me describe something we've been doing citywide that is, I think, somewhat relevant to this. <coughs> One of the fundamental challenges we've seen both in the world of making and in the world of computer science within Pittsburgh as a city is that we have a number of diverse uh, stakeholders who provide after-school programming and in-school programming around, for instance, intro to CS classwork. Carnegie Science Center, Assets to Education, Assemble, we have many, many different organizations around town, Gwen's Girls, YMCA, YWCA. But what's odd is if you look at the soccer programs, the Dynamo soccer programs or the karate programs in Pittsburgh, there is a very obvious pathway that has wayfinding associated with it, where parents understand the wayfinding. They know that if the child takes class number one, what's the progression of coursework that I can do in, in school and out of school that allows my child to develop a deeper and deeper interest in that subject area. That exists for sports, we've nailed that down. We don't have that for computer science, nor for robotics, nor for making in Pittsburgh. Instead, we have classes that are balkanized with no obvious wayfinding for parents and caregivers through a pathway that causes you to get ever increasing sophistication and mindfulness with that practice. That doesn't solve the problem of capacity building at the undergraduate level, but it's fundamental that what we need is a place for people to express their interest K through 12. And that needs to be able to happen no matter which school they're in. So to me, I think parental wayfinding is actually part of the solution longer term, generationally. And something that we're starting to work at in Pittsburgh, but only because we did this assay for the last two years funded by local foundations to understand and recognize how little of that exists today. So you just turn that back on K-12? I just did. So um, you, you're, you motivated it by saying, well, once CSP takes fire, we're going to be overwhelmed with students. We're already overwhelmed with students. Stanford has 95% of their undergraduate body goes through their intro course. Um, we're, we're at 50 to 60% of a 26,000 person undergraduate body that we're, we're passing through. Um, what's interesting is that the lower division, the intro classes for you know, freshman and sophomore levels, they scale with the students. We have students teachers. So we, Stanford, UW, a lot of other universities allow for student undergraduate TAs. They're amazing. They're the best teachers. They're way better than any grad student you're going to give me who kind of doesn't want to teach because they have a requirement. You, you grab an undergraduate who loves and passionate about a course and they follow that course, you're going to have the best incredible teachers in that space. So our lower division is actually scaling without to bound. In fact, our intro programming course, CS61A, had 1,700 students in one class. And we believe it's the largest we've ever seen in not just Berkeley, but I've talked about you know, Michigan, Texas, Harvard, no one else even touches that number. So it may be the largest class ever. That's incredible. And they're able to, and guess what the student happiness rating is? 6.7, it's the highest ever. So somehow they're making things work at scale. And they're using a lot of the things they've learned from the online learning in the MOOC space. Armando Fox and his leadership with the Berkeley Center for Resources uh, for Online Education. They are filming their, video, they're filming their lectures beforehand there's no room that holds 1,700 people, but they film the lectures beforehand and the student can then either attend lecture face-to-face -face or watch the lecture on their own at double time. It'd be more efficient. So the students are choosing. They're, they're voluntarily choosing not to come to class. You can come to class if you want to. Out of 1,700 students, 800-person classroom, only 500 show up. So the 1,200 are making decisions. Yeah, you know, I'll watch it online. It's like a Khan Academy model. So many of the online learning tools that they're building, all the... There's no more readers. You used to have to pay somebody. Here, I'm paying you to be a grader for all the homework that gets submitted on paper. That's not happening. It's all auto-graded now. So all of the kind of intelligent tutoring, is all that work is factoring into the way these courses are being delivered at scale. So it's incredible. It's not just you bookify the whole thing. It's like you're using the tools you're building toward that space to make this really scalable. The lower division scales. The upper division wasn't scaling because A, the campus 
was moving money into the department. The numbers were going like this, you know, from your point of view, they're going like this every year. And the campus wasn't moving money in per student. So for every additional student comes in, you don't get any more money. So wait, if we don't get more money, how are we supposed to, to scale to this camp? We couldn't pay the TAs. So they just had a new, a new uh, meeting and they now are gonna be able to have money come with the student. So past a certain limit, that allows us to be able to hire the group of TAs we have. And so now the key thing is, how do we quickly find a junior who's gonna ace the course, maybe give a special deal to a sophomore to ace the course, so they're around afterwards. If you get a senior and they're great, but they leave, there's no TA anymore. And the number of grad students is fixed. So it has to be, it, there, you, you try to, in summary, you have to find what are the breaking points. The breaking points, we weren't getting money, we fixed that problem. We didn't have TAs, now let's get someone undergrad TAs. We couldn't grade in, in fact, well let's have on, online tools to make that happen, an auto grading. So at every stage, I encourage all the universities that are feeling that pinch to see where the breaking points in this, where the seams that are kind of breaking and busting in a shirt that doesn't fit, like I'm becoming a Hulk, where are the seams are breaking in my Hulkness? In their courses, which are, which are really growing in incredible numbers, and try to fix those. So, and the, Google's done a great job to fund a lot of innovation, and they even had local meetings where they share, what did you do, what did you do, and let them all feed that. So I think Google stepped forward to try to fund some of the innovation, that's one of the things we've done, is to look for online learning spaces. Is it because it's a gut course? That it's popular. I, I, I went to Harvard, and uh, we used to talk about gut courses. Gut being it's too easy? Yeah. That I'll get an A no matter what not I at do. All. If I, not if not I at register, all. Not, not will at all. I get an A? Not at all. Not at all. People, well, ask Maron, why are people coming to the classes? They realize this is important for them. People are realizing this, this is the digital future. We're having, you know, almost everybody's coming from the College of Business. They realize, I better learn some computer science. So th those people have their finger on the pulse of what's important. So there's a huge flow of that. And what's wonderful is as you start to approach the population of the campus, your diversity numbers will get better. If the campus is 50-50, all of a sudden, we, without doing any more work, if more students come from the rest of campus, your diversity numbers just get greater and greater. And so you're starting to reach the entire campus. I would love to get to 100% of the campus. And I, in fact, people have argued, don't mandate, this is an interesting question for K-12, don't mandate CS for the campus because maybe you get 95% of people who are happy, but that last 5% will come kicking and screaming. I don't want to be there. The reason I didn't sign up for the class, just make it awesome. Stanford has 95% of their students. We're growing to that point. We're at 50, 60. So just make it an amazing experience and they'll come. Don't mandate CS principles. They would argue, just make it amazing. The whole student will kind of want, want to come there. So it's an interesting way to argue that. Yeah, let, let me follow up a little bit on, on this. So when the students, you know, getting them engaged initially, maybe taking a course, right? And you guys both mentioned, though, the pipeline. What do they do next? At the college level, what is the pathway? And, and are those students that have success in the literacy course, how do they transition, say, into regular CS courses? Well, we, we've built the last three weeks of our non-majors course to be exactly the impedance match to our majors course. So we figured, look, the majors course is in Python. Let's give a little intro to Python. So if they kind of catch by the end, like, oh, I think this is for me, then A, we require this, we, we obviously have CS principles course, but at the university, we can do anything we want to in terms of our requirements. So we have a big final project. So we teach a couple of weeks of Python, and then we say, you know, the folks who are maybe taking the course for majors in Python, do your final project in Python. That will let you get at least something, and again, we let them choose, as I, as I advocated before, they choose any project they want. They choose any topic they want. It has to be approved to make sure it's not too hard, not too easy with a TA, but the point is, choose something in Python. That'll prepare you. All of a sudden now, I walk into this course, and I've, I've been hacking on Python for a month, and I'm coming to this course for major, so that's great. And the folks who decide not to go in and be a major, if you just have one course, you kind of, that, that CS principles course does capture what you'd like to teach. In fact, on the board we said, what would you do if you had a single course to reach every single person in the country? What would you want to teach them? And that's, what, that's how we credit our course. So it's about, if, even if people just take one, uh, one touch and go away, that's, that's wonderful, because you've got a sense, that you feel like you're a programmer. You walked out and you now know how to program, how to debug all the things you talked about, that, that was fun and hard initially, but now you feel like that, and you built this huge project at the end and showed the demo. You can do it. That, that, that sense of I can do it is an amazing sense. And students talk all about it when they're big. You know, at the end, they say, Dan, this is a really great change of life. That's the kind of thing they talk about, how that project it was this. That was the chance I really got to be creative, and I got to feel like I can do it. And the I can do it means you can now learn another language where you want to, or stay in the same language and build more tools and do other things. And it's all, it's all testament to Scratch and, and logo days. I mean, the, the, the programming, the, the abstractions, it's so much easier programming a block based language than it is a text based language for people who are learning intro class. It's just it's a win. We move into application. What we'll see across College of the Arts, College of Fine Arts, and Digital Humanities sites at Carnegie Mellon is 
a whole lot of students will do what we have summer undergraduate research programs, and then we have during the school, same thing, we have undergraduate research programs. So the general idea is the students have learned to program. Now, what are they going to do with that program? And we basically emplaced it into labs, like Golan Lovell did at Lab in Art, where what they're doing is creating sculptural artifacts using programming to try to make some social commentary. I'm going to keep coming back to that, sorry. And what we're doing over and over again is creating as many opportunities as we can for them to engage with laboratories and to engage with each other. We have a program called Meeting of the Minds, where the students work together, propose a project as a team project. We give them a little bit of research funding. They get enough credit to al allocate a significant chunk of their time during the school year to that. And there's a huge show at the end of the year where they show what they've accomplished. And we have some interesting results. One student pair that I was just judging uh, created whiteboards, digital whiteboards, in two neighborhoods in Pittsburgh that are on opposite sides of a gentrification battle. And the whiteboards allow people on one side and the other side to actually message each other and write to each other about how they feel. It was all computer science, but it's computer science for community interaction between two disparate communities. We've also, of course, pushed out the boundary in terms of post undergrad programs. So we have a master's program now that's a fifth year program, and then that fifth year co-term program and the fifth year regular master's program actually have numbers that have been skyrocketing. So we, I think we've tripled the number of people we admit for those programs, precisely because there's so much demand for people to take the computer science chops they have and apply them to actual research programming. We have a question over here. Hi, Patty Ordanez from the University of Puerto Rico. <laughs> so, I've tried to do reverse MOOCs just because I want, you know, my students, we don't have that many resources at the University of Puerto Rico and we, you know, the technology that are used in these classes, you know, they could do a lot more. And the thing that we found when we did it actually with Stanford is that our, our students, because they're bilingual, but they are more predominant in Spanish, is that they watch the videos like 20 times more than the average person in the US. And so then it's, it's this question of um, would they, you know, does it, yes, they learned it and they did really well and they became programmers and, but the anxiety that they experienced <laughs> for it not being in their native language, um, is there a place where this, if, you know, maybe you, taking the content and making it for these different cultures and different languages um, would be valuable because of the anxiety and, and, you know, doing equity. Like, I love these MOOCs. I love them, but English is my first language. And so what I found is when I gave it to my students, it wasn't the same experience, but they learned, yes, but it cost them a lot more time. So my question is, <laughs> do you see how this is great that all this money is being invested there, but it should be also if you really want true diversity, it has to also reach these other places that don't have the resources that the universities that you're at have. Um, and so my question is, 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 would Google or other people be in, you know, companies be interested in investing into this kind of research where we could work with you all at trying to bring that content, but also in a, in a language that would be more accessible for the places with less resources? I believe that uh, they are working on making translations of MOOCs. For, I mean, as programming languages, Scratch and Snap are examples. They're in what, how many languages? 23, I think, or at least. And yeah. App Inventor, you know, we haven't talked about it. We haven't talked about App Inventor. And that, too, is being translated into different languages. Um, that's one of the things that in 1969 or 70, I insisted on with Logo, that it be in other languages. And but uh, let me, pardon, so just, just to realize, so you, to make the, 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 the parallel. So, Spanish, translating into Spanish, is very different than translating for Puerto Ricans. Um, it would be the equivalent to us getting a British translation, which in some cases the words are very different. And it makes a big difference, I found, that if they see a Puerto Rican... You have to speak up and you have to get in touch with people that are doing translations to say you'd like to do one for Puerto Rican Spanish. I mean, you can't wait for somebody else. You have to be proactive. 
It's like uh, French Canadian and French French. So I'm going to give a different kind of answer because fundamentally, the problem that I have with MOOC comes down to there's this whole uh, there's an architect named Horst Rietel who defined this concept of a wicked problem. And he said that when we solve problems that have an underlying sociological component to them, they're local. And when you copy and paste them somewhere else, you fail. And you fail because culture is a critical component of the habits of mind that have to develop. So to me, I turn the problem on its head and I ask, how do we cause the best education possible to happen in Puerto Rico? And my answer is actually professional development. We don't do it, in my opinion, minority, by taking shrink-wrap curriculum and figuring out how to translate it. We do it by creating the capacity for outstanding professional development, where the best practices from anywhere, De Anza College, can also happen in Puerto Rico with the people who are gonna be the teachers there, the pre-service teachers who are gonna become the in-service. So to me, it's about PD. And if we can do PD right in a scalable manner, that's the most mindful way to create local, acculturated phenomena in each place. Uh, that's something that I'm called constantly concerned about because we spend so much less money on that than we do billions of dollars that we invest in MOOC companies. And I understand the statistical numbers. We can put many, many zeros behind a MOOC. And even if the follow-through rate's small, fractionally, wow, that's a lot of people. I get that. But, and I said this story earlier today at the 8 o'clock session, you know, we have West Virginia families who don't let their kids take computer science classes because they're afraid the kids will leave West Virginia if they take the computer science class. That's culture. And the way we solve that is by having teachers talk to those families. It has nothing to do with delivery mechanisms. It has to do with emotion and empathy and communication that's local. And I think that's what it takes to really nail the equity problem. Are there, is there other, other questions? I would like to say one thing about elementary school and high school is um, we don't take advantage of the children as teachers. They're fabulous teachers and somehow their schedules, uh, whatever, um, don't allow it to happen. And if we want to spread things, we need to take advantage of these great teacher learners Thanks. Uh, maybe you guys want to say one last last word. Um, okay. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about blocks programming, and I just want to put one last push for that because I think it came up. But I want to make sure that how important when the the environment is when you're first touching a computer. And I think this is we're seeing great success uh, with Scratch certainly in, in the K through eight space. Um, we're seeing success with block space introductions in the hour of code. Um, I would actually like to make folks who are teaching CS1 think about blocks as a possible as a possible space for you. I think there's a perception that blocks isn't coding. A lot of environments let you turn a little dial and you, you see the blocks and you turn a dial and here's the code, that's, here's the text-based equivalent, not just code, but here's the, it's all code, but here's the text equivalent. Kind of allowing this little transformation is really wonderful. GP has that, um, Snap is talking about adding that. So I, I think, um, you have to get over this kid's mindset that blocks are the wrong thing, but there are so many affordances that blocks give you that code, that text-based coding doesn't. Um, you don't have to memorize things. You, you don't get typos. You, you, you can write a sentence. If you have a block, if you have blocks language, you can write pseudocode that's closer to the pseudocode of, of the textbooks and the algorithm textbooks than you can with anything else. You know, Even Python, which looks like pseudocode. Oh, Python is like pseudocode that runs? Yeah, except the arguments are all at the end. Show me a function where it's put the item in the list behind the, so, like that's, that's the way I think about it. And you can write this in Snap, you can write this in other, so I wanna encourage more people to kind of think about the block space for the intro computer space. I think that's really, really where the future is. Yeah, and I, and I think part of it is not just kids have a bias against visual language, like it's not coding, but computer scientists have a bias. I think that's changing a little bit. I agree 100% with both what Dan, Dan and Dave just said. Um, I guess the one other point I would make uh, goes back to diversity. We talked about diversity and equity a little bit. And I just want to remind people it's very, very hard to do diversity right. It's very easy to fall into the trap of believing that we're making a change in really attracting a diverse audience to computer science. 
when really what that takes is that we become so mindful of computer science that we rethink the application of computer science to the real world. And I think fundamentally, we have to understand better than we do as a society how we're gonna engage children in a diverse fashion into the world of STEM education. Uh, we have all these presidential reports that come out on STEM. They talk about how important STEM is and how many careers there are gonna be in STEM. And I'm not at all convinced because we have artificial intelligence catching up with us very, very quickly indeed. And so if we're going to have diverse stakeholders understanding how computer science plays with our future, we have to start staring at this question of what our social contract is and how we and AI are gonna play fair with one another. And at some point that elephant in the room has to get recognized in the classroom by our children. You got the final word. projects I know in the Boston area is run by um, Mel King and it's um, uh, the South End Technology Center and there he pays high school students to come to a project called Teach to Learn, Learn to Teach and these guys uh, go through an intensive program during the year and then in the summer they work with middle school or younger kids. And it makes, they come out saying, they don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and stuff like that. So I'd like to see more of that kind of uh, project going on. I'm really concerned uh, that elementary school children are going to be channeled in some very unimaginative, uncreative uh, introduction to computers. They are not going to take advantage of the kinds of things that go on in the real life of anyone. Create that. All right, thank you. Well, let's, let's thank the panelists.